We'll begin with an important content warning. This presentation will not include explicit sexual content, but will discuss sex and sexuality, including the topic of grooming, dubious consent, and sexual coercion. If you believe it would be harmful for your mental health to be exposed to these topics, please see the links in the video description down below where you'll be directed to Lydia Craig's virtual Jane Con discussion happening right now entitled Wealthy Black Britons in High Society, comparing Jane Austen's unfinished 1817 work Sanditon to Alicia Lafanu's 1823 novel Fashionable Connections. Or join the book talk also happening now featuring Jillian Cantor, author of a sweet Emma retelling entitled The Code for Love and Heartbreak and Lauren Edmondson, author of Sense and Sensibility Modernization, Ladies of the House. Before we get into trying to answer the big question posed in the title of this talk, let me first introduce myself. I'm Lacey Phillips. I am a writer and communications professional who helps nonprofits address important societal issues and share their success stories. The bulk of my work and personal advocacy over the course of the last two decades has revolved around promoting gender equity. I've been involved in everything from helping a local nonprofit bring parenting classes and free prenatal care to disadvantaged communities in my city, to an international effort to address the lack of women in STEM fields that introduces educational interventions to preteen girls. I'm currently the host of That's Problematic, a podcast that examines problematic relationships in literature. And speaking of problematic relationships in literature, Being a longtime fan of Jane Austen and someone who regularly dissects texts to highlight toxic behaviors for my podcast, perhaps it was inevitable that my mind would conjure this question. Did Knightley groom Emma? I know, it's a big question. And your first reaction may be to think it's preposterous. Or possible. Or perhaps probable. Take a moment right now to type into the live chat what your first reaction was to seeing this question posed in the virtual Jane Con program. I know that when this question first occurred to me, I had that reaction like um, kombucha girl of internet fame. No. Well. <laughs> But once I had sat with it for a while and had gotten past my initial shock and outright dismissal, I started thinking deeply about the root of the question, and it stuck with me over the long term. I keep turning it over in my mind and finding new angles to view it from. So while yes, I admit that the title of this talk leans heavily on our grand tradition of clickbait and sensationalization, I believe this is very much a discussion worth having. And I'm so glad that you'll be joining me here in the chat as we unpack it all during virtual GenCon. So let's dive right in. The first thing that we need to establish is to define what grooming is. According to the UK's National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, grooming is the act of building a relationship, trust, and an emotional connection with a younger person in order to manipulate, exploit, or abuse them. Let's break that down. In order for a pattern of behavior to be considered grooming, there must be an age gap, action taken to establish or deepen a relationship, and an attempt to influence the younger person. Now there's no abuse detailed explicitly in the source text, so we can safely set that criteria to one side. But manipulation and exploitation are still very much on the table when we're talking about Knightley and Emma and we'll be exploring some examples of both in the source text. But first, let's address the all-important age gap. In the novel, for reference, Harriet Smith is 17, Emma Woodhouse is 21, and Mr. George Knightley is 37. Those of you who are good at math have already figured out that there is a 16-year age gap between them. For comparison, Emma's sister, Isabella Knightley, is 27, and George's brother, Mr. John Knightley, is 31, putting them much closer in age than younger sister Emma and older brother George, with an age gap of only four years. 
It's interesting to note that the 16-year age gap between George and Emma is not the biggest to be found in Austen's work. That honor belongs to... In Sense and Sensibility, 17-year-old Marianne Dashwood marries a 35-year-old Colonel Brandon, an age gap of 18 years involving a significantly less mature young woman who wouldn't even be considered an adult under many modern age of consent laws. And she would have had to obtain parental permission to marry even in 1811 when the novel in which she appears was first published. And yet, modern readers routinely object more strongly to the age gap between Emma and Knightley than the one between Marianne and Colonel Brandon, or the fact that Edmund Bertram married his first cousin Fanny Price, whom he'd lived with since she was 10 and he was 16. In examining the reasons why Knightley and Emma occupy so much of the focus in Austen's canon when it comes to criticism of their relationship, I came across this illustration in The Guardian, which puts Austen's most problematic protagonist couples together with a partial quote from Sandra Gilbert and Susan Guba's 1979 book, The Mad Woman in the Attic, the woman writer in the 19th century literary imagination that examines classic literature from a feminist perspective. This graphic was not developed for video, so don't stress if you're having a hard time reading it. There are links to all of the sources I reference in the description below and you can explore all of those at your leisure after the talk. And don't worry, I'll just read you the small print. The happy ending of an Austen novel occurs when the girl becomes a daughter to her husband, an older and wiser man who has been her teacher and her advisor. I wanted to draw attention to the fact that the Gilbert and Guba partial quote here gives a much different context than the full quote, which reads, Aware that male superiority is far more than a fiction, Jane Austen always defers to the economic, social, and political power of men as she dramatizes how and why female survival depends on gaining male approval and protection. All the heroines who reject inadequate fathers are engaged in a search for better, more sensitive men who are, nevertheless, still the representatives of authority. As in Northanger Abbey, the happy ending of an Austen novel occurs when the girl becomes a daughter to her husband, an older and wiser man who has been her teacher and her advisor, whose house can provide her with shelter and sustenance and at least derived status, reflected glory. Whether it be parsonage or ancestral mansion, the man's house is where the heroine can retreat from both her parents' inadequacies and the perils of the outside world. I would argue that this excerpt is not a great fit for our current discussion because Emma does not reject her inadequate father and go in search of a husband to provide shelter, sustenance, and status. In fact, she outright dismisses the idea of seeking a husband several times throughout the text because she is so well provided for and comfortable in her current circumstances. I do so wonder, Miss Woodhouse, that you're not married. I have no inducements to marry. I lack neither fortune nor position, and never could I be so important in a man's eyes as I am in my father's. Mm. But to be an old maid like Miss Bates... She is a poor old maid, and it is only poverty which makes celibacy contemptible. A single woman of good fortune is always respectable. I do so wonder, Miss Woodhouse, that you should not be going to be married. So charming as you are. Mm -hmm. I have none of the usual inducements of women to marry. Fortune I do not want. Employment I do not want. Consequence I do not want. I believe few married women are half as much mistress of the husband's house as I am of Hartfield. There are multiple other excerpts from the book where Emma rejects societal pressure to marry, but in the interest of saving time and because it's slightly tangential to our thesis, we're not going to read through them together, but if you check out the links in the description of this video, you can download the full slide deck, which will include additional text from Emma that supports the point. So, if it's not the close familial relationship and cohabitation of Fanny Price and Edmund Bertram, 
were the opportunism and larger age gap between Marianne Dashwood and Colonel Brandon that attracts the ire of modern readers? What is it about Emma and Knightley that creates such strong reactions? Kirk Companion, blogger for Austin and Boston, in conversation with Austin scholar Dr. Sarah Emsley, conjectures. He's acted as a mentor or surrogate relative throughout Emma's formative years, especially since Emma hasn't had a true active parent, given that Mr. Woodhouse has been too concerned with his own health, or guardian, given that Miss Taylor has always been too easy on her. In short, the argument here is that it's not so much the raw numbers that work against George and Emma, but the ways in which George has offered parental style guidance throughout Emma's life that alerts readers to a sense of wrongness. A lot of times readers may not even be able to pinpoint the true source of the ick factor that they're feeling as having incestuous or grooming overtones. They just know that something isn't right and has caused a blip on their wrongness radar. So they will identify the obvious, the age gap, and leave it at that. Let's take a look at some more excerpts from the novel that stood out to me as being possible red flags during a recent rereading. And be sure to let me know in the chat what your thoughts on these excerpts is. If you agree or disagree with me singling them out as examples of manipulative or exploitative behavior that could be perceived as indications of grooming. We all know this scene. Badly done, Emma. Badly done, Emma. Badly done indeed. This was badly done, Emma. It was badly done indeed. Devastating. This is the climactic scene from Box Hill, wherein George scolds Emma for her public mocking of Miss Bates. It gets included in every film adaptation largely intact, but there is so much more of George Knightley's dialogue from the novel that isn't often included in filmed adaptations that I believe sheds a lot of light on how his relationship with Emma has developed over time. For instance, in a scene where Mr. Knightley is consulting Mrs. Weston about whether or not Emma's new friendship with Harriet is good for her or not, he says, Emma has been meaning to read more <clears throat> Emma has been meaning to read more ever since she was 12 years old. I've seen a great many lists of her drawing up at various times of books that she meant to read regularly through, and very good lists they were, very well chosen and very neatly arranged sometimes alphabetically and sometimes by some other rule. The list she drew up when only 14, I remember thinking it did her judgment so much credit that I preserved it some time, and I dare say she may have made out a very good list now. Here we have someone who is 30 years old keeping a 14-year-old's list of books as a memento. Now where have I seen that before? Oh! Right, and Emma. We know from the context given by Austen in the very same text that people in Regency era England would sometimes keep small mementos from people they were in love with because we see Harriet Smith describe a piece of bandage and the end of an old pencil as her most precious treasures because of their association with Mr. Elton, the subject of her crush. So to me, it's quite telling that even seven years before the events described in the novel, George Knightley may have been having romantic feelings for Emma. In fact, he admits as much in chapter 17, when he and Emma are discussing Mrs. Weston's new baby being brought up with as much leniency as her former governess treated her with, and how Mr. Knightley endeavored to correct and counteract this indulgence. Nature gave you understanding. Miss Taylor gave you principles. You must have done well. My interference was quite as likely to do harm as good. It was very natural for you to say, what right has he to lecture me? And I'm very afraid. <clears throat> Nature gave you understanding. Miss Taylor gave you principles. You must have done well. My interference was quite as likely to do harm as good. 
It was very natural for you to say, what right has he to lecture me? And, I'm afraid, very natural for you to feel that it was done in a disagreeable manner. I do not believe I did you any good. The good was all to myself by making you an object of the tenderest affection to me. I could not think about you so much without doting on you, faults and all, and by dint of fancying so many errors, have been in love with you ever since you were thirteen at least. This is perhaps the most damning passage in the book because it highlights how very young Emma was when Knightley started having romantic feelings for her and how much his interference in her life has impacted her subsequent behavior, which by his own admission resulted in making her the object of his affection, all of which pretty clearly meets the NSPCC criteria for grooming we discussed earlier. Though it is worth noting that according to research compiled by Roy and Leslie Atkins for their book Eavesdropping on Jane Austen's England, How Our Ancestors Lived Two Centuries Ago, that the age of consent in 1815 was 12 for girls and 14 for boys, which was a law carried over from the Roman Catholic Church into the Church of England, which was in turn based on an ancient Roman law. For reference, the Statute of Westminster passed in the year 1275 set the age of sexual consent in England at 12 years old. The Offense Against the Persons Act raised the age of consent in England to 13 years of age, but only in the year 1875. Today, the age of consent in England is 16, but that was only changed in the year 2003 by the Sexual Offenses Act. So, even though legally and arguably societally, it was acceptable for a 29-year-old George to have romantic feelings for a 13-year-old Emma, the legal age of majority in 1815 was still 21. Anyone under the age of 21 was considered a minor and had to obtain parental consent to marry. And this is perhaps one of the things that I find particularly compelling when trying to make the argument for grooming. It's just it's just the timing. At some point you have to take a look at the timeline of events in the novel and admit that when you lay it all out it really doesn't look good for George. From what we know from evidence in the text, George didn't begin to take on the role of parental style advisor to Emma until after her older sister had married and left home. Emma's mother had been long dead by that point so there was a sort of influence vacuum that George stepped into. NSPCC research has concluded that lonely children are twice as likely to be groomed, and Emma is, arguably, Austen's loneliest heroine. When George makes his declaration of love and proposes marriage to Emma, she just so happens to be 21 years old, meaning she wouldn't have had to obtain Mr. Woodhouse's permission to marry. And that's convenient. Most film adaptations don't include anything much after Knightley delivers his if I loved you less I might be able to talk about it more line. They cut directly from declaration of love to a climactic wedding with only brief stops in between to tie up loose ends with Harriet and Robert Martin and secure Mr. Woodhouse's comfort by deciding to cohabitate at Hartfield. But there are six chapters after that scene in the book that contain a lot of context. This is so strange. I held you in my arms when you were three weeks old. Do you like me as well now as you did then? That's not in the book. Anywhere. I looked. What is in the book is a scene in which George has informed his brother of his intention to marry Emma and receives a reply that he discusses with his fiancée. I'm amused by one part of John's letter, did you notice it, where he says that my information did not take him wholly by surprise, that he was rather in expectation of hearing something of the kind. If I understand your brother, he only means so far as you are having some thoughts of marrying, he had no idea of me. He seems perfectly unprepared for that. Yes, yes, but I'm amused that he should have seen so far into my feelings. What has he been judging by? I am not conscious of any difference in my spirits or conversation that could prepare him at this time for my marrying any more than at another. This is a passage that in some ways acquits George and in some ways supports the idea that he's had the intention to marry Emma in mind long enough for those closest to him 
to have almost been in expectation of the announcement of their engagement. This is a contradiction that's further explored by Austin in the previous chapter, where she writes this insight into George's feelings. On his side, there had been a long-standing jealousy, old as the arrival or even expectation of Frank Churchill. He had been in love with Emma and jealous of Frank Churchill from about the same period, one sentiment having probably enlightened him as to the other. It was his jealousy of Frank Churchill that had taken him from the country. The Box Hill party had decided him on going away. He would save himself from witnessing again such permitted, encouraged attentions. He had gone to learn to be indifferent. But he had gone to a wrong place. There was too much domestic happiness in his brother's house. Woman wore too amiable form in it. Isabella was too much like Emma, differing only in those striking inferiorities which always brought the other in brilliancy before him for much to have been done, even had his time been longer. He stayed on, however, vigorously, day after day. This is key insight into an event that occurred earlier in the book. To George's credit, when he perceives that Emma's interest in Frank Churchill had the potential to develop into a formal courtship, he removed himself as an influence by taking an extended visit to his brother's home in London. If he were truly hoping to prey on Emma, he would have stayed. He would have stayed and tried to influence her against him. I think when most people read the part of the book where George leaves abruptly for London after the Box Hill excursion, they interpret his actions as a self-preservation tactic. There's a flavor of noble sacrifice to it that reminds me of the themes Austen further explores in her next novel, Persuasion, published in 1816, only one year after Emma. You have to consider that for seven or eight years at that point, George has been in love with Emma. His decision to leave and clear the playing field for Frank Churchill is a clear illustration of his willingness to sacrifice his own desires in favor of Emma's ultimate happiness. And that's the thing, above all others, that in my mind at least fully acquits George Knightley of the charge of grooming Emma Woodhouse. While there's conflicting evidence in the text, I think it would be harder to conclude that Knightley intended to groom Emma than to prove the opposite. Given all these examples from the text that we've explored here together, I'm confident in that assessment, but I do have some key takeaways. Not all romantic relationships between older men and younger women have a grooming component. Not all attempts to influence the behavior of an inferior is grooming. And one could argue that all finishing schools of the time were little more than a form of institutionalized grooming. But that's going to have to be a discussion for another time. Incidentally, I have some additional information on this topic that brings together some examples from classic literature, contemporary historical fiction, and other media that I wanted to bring into the discussion around differentiating between grooming and age gaps and power imbalances between romantic partners that I just didn't have time to fit into this talk. And I found there was enough material within the source text alone that I didn't need to bring in external references. But if there's enough interest, let me know over in the chat and subscribe to this channel and maybe I'll work up a follow-up video with that information. Because it's a lot. Thank you so much for joining me here at Virtual Jane Con and contributing to this discussion. I hope you got a lot out of it. If you're interested in further discussions of problematic relationships in literature, that's what I do here on this YouTube channel for the podcast That's Problematic. So go ahead and hit the subscribe button to be notified of new episodes when they go live. The podcast is available on all major platforms wherever you prefer to listen. We'll be launching a series of full episodes soon. <sighs> I don't know when. Soon. Sometime. I guess. I wanted to thank Bianca Hernandez Knight for her work putting together Virtual Jane Con this year and for nurturing an inclusive and fun fan space in the Jane Austen universe and book hoarding all year round. Again, I'm Lacey Phillips, and I'm good at this.